history often been a merger of public and private and the sort of achievement of a kind of synergistic relationship between them. So the Bema that I just showed you from Athens was a fully public construction. Here in Rome, we have a space where full of private activity, commercial activity, and yet conversations that were public and political in nature occurred here. Groups formed, associations gathered to drive their political views forward. If we go to the next slide, we're in London, early modern London in the 17th century, where again, um, we see a merger of private and public. The coffee houses are famously um, described by Jürgen Habermas, German political philosopher, as the site of the emergence of the modern public sphere. Why were they so important? Because that's where you could go get a newspaper. There weren't enough physical copies to go around for them to all be delivered to people's doorsteps. So people gathered where the discourse was. And that's the really important point. Discourse itself is a gathering point. It's a point of connection. And so we had print culture expanding in this period, newspapers bringing news from distant lands. This is the age of colonization now underway, of course. So there's that news as well as the news of the day. And again, clubs connected to coffee houses, associations formed, uh, challenges to the king would emerge from this context and negotiation among different categories of people, merchants, um, artisans, and so forth um, in the coffee house. So economic questions, political questions, social questions, all intersected, again, around a convening space anchored by discourse. Um, next slide takes us all the way up into the 21st century. Um, modern efforts by the uh, mayor of London um, to think about social cohesion. And here you'll notice that there is an emphasis on egalitarian uh, practices and participation as a part of the achievement of social cohesion, a recognition that our intentionality that we bring to the design of our public spaces can affect the texture of people's daily life, as well as the texture of their public, civic, political relationships with each other. So I encourage you all to visit um, the report that they put out, lots of wonderful designs for thinking about, or ideas rather, for thinking about how intentionality in design can support a healthy civic life. But if we go to the next slide, I wanna make a point about what it means for discourse to be at the center of how we design spaces where we come together. This is a picture of the Hoover Dam. And I love it because it is, of course, a dam that generates electricity, generates power. Discourse is ultimately more about flow than space, in my view. It is about the passage of ideas and possibilities, horizons of imagination from one person to another through communication. And just as discourse flows, it brings power in the same way that water um, flowing can generate power. The dam, of course, is a design. It's a very specific design for how to channel the kind of power that flows through discourse. The public spheres I've shown you, the Greek, the Roman, the coffee house, those two are all designs that ultimately channel power and are about thinking about how the public design and the private design intersect in the channeling of power. Now, this is what brings us up to our most challenging question as we think about public spaces on the internet. It's impossible to have any kind of discourse space around which people convene that doesn't organize power in some fashion. The only question is how you're organizing power and how you are bringing public projects and private projects in relationship to each other in the organization of power. Consequently, once you recognize that, you have to understand that you have to have goals for the organization of power to help you think about the design of public spaces, even on the internet. So I wanna spend my last two minutes here just focusing on the question of what those goals might be for how we organize the space in which discourse travels and where people convene around discourse. So let's go to the next slide, please. This one is the most abstract and dense, so I apologize for that. Um, but what it is offering is a characterization of different polities. That is, it's a way of characterizing how different societies organize their political life or anchor political organization. All right. And so this reflects sort of many generations of work by political philosophers. And it also reflects the premise that the globe is not a homogenous space. Rather, you have different regime types across the globe. And the question of how the internet interacts with those is at the core 
of what you want in the design of a public sphere. So first, there's a distinction between um, you know, more or less uh, indecent regimes, which are completely rights violating across all dimensions and don't provide material security to their populations, and then decent regimes, which provide some categories of public goods. In the category of indecent regimes at the moment, you might think about Syria, you might think about Venezuela, where populations are obviously been left completely vulnerable to predations of all kinds against each other and from the state in relationship to the population. Then you have your category of decent regimes where there are ultimately five things they might deliver and different regimes are seeking to deliver different ones of these. So this is where we have to set our own goals and make a determination for ourselves. So at some level, no regime is legitimate if it can't deliver basic material security. That's an important premise. Then there are the sets of rights we care about. Negative rights are protections of things like expression and conscience and association. Positive rights are rights to participate, to be a co-creator or co-owner of public spaces, to co-design the public life we share together. Social rights are about the provision of education and health, uh, the resources people need in order to achieve full flourishing. And then most importantly, something that we've really only come to see in the 21st century, there's also a potential goal of achieving non-discrimination or egalitarian social relations, or as I also sometimes call it, difference without domination. Protection of the negative rights of speech, expression, association, that generates difference. A difference is a beautiful thing. We do want to associate with people with whom we share a sense of affinity and perspective, and we want the freedom to do that that will inevitably generate difference. The goal is to support the emergence of difference through the protection of those negative liberties in ways that don't result in difference generating domination. So at the same time that you're thinking about how to protect negative liberties, you also have to think about how to avoid or undo where it emerges domination. So if you think about a China, that's a society that does focus on the delivery of material security it also focuses to some extent on social rights. It's got reasonable health provision, for example, for parts of its population, not for its whole population, but for parts of its population. And the design of a public sphere for China, if that, if, if one's from inside a sort of the frame of a China perspective, will focus on those elements and won't be about the protection of negative liberties or positive liberties of participation, for instance. In a constitutional democracy or an egalitarian participatory democracy, we are seeking to empower people as authors of their own lives, which also means authors of their communities. So that does require protection of negative liberties, positive liberties, social rights, and the work on non-domination or an, or an anti-discrimination. So in that regard, I think one of the biggest challenges of the internet has, was the early idea that we could have one thing for the entire globe, that you could build a Facebook and the rules would just be the same everywhere. That's very far from the truth. Every example of people convening around discourse is an example of a public sphere. And therefore, any given society needs to bring intentionality to the design of that public sphere to align with its objectives as a society. So the ways in which platforms work in the US can and should be different from how they work uh, in other um, societies that have different overarching goals and objectives. So that's the frame. Now then the hard work starts of how do we get our hands back around the designs that can deliver the public sphere we need through synergies between private and public. I so welcome this festival. Thank you again, uh, Eli and Talia for pulling it all together.